Hello and welcome. I'm Adi Keo, Editor-in-Chief of the AMA Journal of Ethics. Thank you for joining us for this video edition of Ethics Talk. I'm here with Matt Worker, the Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist at Politico. And we will be talking about the creative process in political cartooning during this COVID-19 pandemic. Matt, welcome to Ethics Talk. Hey, nice to meet you, great to be here. So in line with its mission to illuminate the art of medicine, the AMA Journal of Ethics leverages the power of the visual arts to augment readers' understandings of important questions in ethics and health policy. Can you help our viewers better understand the conceptual and planning part of your creative process as an editorial cartoonist? Well, um, let me just say that I, I think that, you know, there's a lot of different ways to share information in, in a visual fashion, but um, I know that I'm a little bit biased here, but I think that a political cartoon is a great combination of visual interest, hopefully a little bit of sort of data graphic mixed in, coated with a little bit of humor or maybe a lot of humor. And um, it's a really effective vehicle for communicating uh, an idea, hopefully a complex idea. The old saw obviously a picture is worth a thousand words. I think it's really true because I think that you can get a lot through a visual image in a yeah. matter of seconds that would be the same as minutes of reading a written piece. So uh, following up on what you've just said, uh, do you see an ethics dimension in your role and responsibilities as Politico's editorial cartoonist? Uh, you know, of course I, I, of course I do. And uh, I mean, the first place I'd start is that uh, I, I feel it's very important to stick to true facts and not be part of, I think that one of the growing problems we have in American politics is sorting out truth from lies, propaganda from, from agitation, things like that. So I would like to uh, think that the work that I do it contributes to sticking to the facts and mm. dealing with true issues. Um, it's a different time for political cartoonists. I mean, we've been around for centuries and for the better part of the last couple centuries, we worked with uh, publications that had gatekeepers, editors, publishers who sort of held you to certain ethical standards or journalistic standards. And these days, a whole lot of political cartooning is done on social media. So there's no, there's very little adult supervision, let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, and so it's important for cartoonists to hold them to some standards. Um, you'll see stuff going out there where people are contributing to crazy stuff like QAnon, conspiracy theories and the like. And um, that to me is incredibly reckless. So job one for a political cartoonist is to deal with facts and, mm -hmm. um, and, and hopefully in a civil manner. Yeah. So how, the, how our government and the American public at large have responded to COVID-19 um, have provided, I think, plenty of fodder for uh, cartoonists. How do you approach cartooning a topic as serious as a pandemic that has affected millions and killed hundreds of thousands in the U.S.? Um, it's a fine line, you know. It, uh, political cartoonists actually deal with fairly heavy issues all the time, issues of yeah. war and peace and things like that. A pandemic is sort of in that same category. And uh, I personally, and I, most of the cartoonists I know and respect, work at trying to contribute to the debate, maybe bring a certain amount of levity to it, um, but never go over the line where you're trivializing or, uh, you know, causing uh, emotional pain to people who are going through horrible things. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you skate right up to that line. A lot of humor is going right up to, right up to the edge of tweaking people. And uh, in situations like COVID, um, it tests that. But you, with, some, with, with some sensitivity, you can do that. Yeah. And so you know, I like to... Well, I was going to okay, say one more go thing. Go ahead. It's the old thing about, you know, laughter is the best medicine. Um, doctors may disagree with this, I understand. But, um, but it's an old saying, and there's something to it. It's like a little levity 
laugh so that we don't cry as we go through stuff that's that's trying or, or whatever, like a like a horrible pandemic like that. I think that that can be also constructive. Yeah, no, I think you make a good point. I think humor and medicine uh, can be used uh, uh, when used appropriately could be quite therapeutic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So now I'd like to switch gears a little bit and uh, have you comment on some of your cartoons. So uh, you've already alluded to this in your earlier points, but misinformation can be deadly during a pandemic. So what were you trying to convey in these two cartoons that you created? Well, um, the, the, the first one is dealing with the, 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 the whole phenomenon of social media. And it's basically, it's a big experiment, a psychological experiment a political experiment, sociological experiment. We have this big, it's like a big public pool and everybody can jump in and everybody can share their information and their opinion or whatever and stuff. Um, but it's in this case, it's like a big public pool that's full right. of all sorts of uh, other <laughs> you know, mischievous characters. <laughs> that like right. And uh, so it was just, Again, a lot of what we do as cartoonists is we're trying to find an apt metaphor that illuminates something in a way that where people can see it in a different light. Um, the other one here is uh, dealing with uh, Donald Trump and uh, the, uh, the misinformation that's been coming out of the White House about the COVID um, situation and stuff. And so I, it would... Sometimes we'll hang cartoons on a news hook. This was after a couple of particularly horrible tornadoes in the U.S. Mm. And uh, so in the morning, I sort of compared the devastation of the misinformation, in this case, to fact checkers in particular, whose job um, I um, do not envy these days. They're working very hard. Yeah, no, I appreciate your point. So uh, this next one, at initial glance, doesn't seem to have much to do with the COVID-19 pandemic. So what were you trying to convey here? Um, again, it gets back to sort of our relationship with truth and science and things like that. Um, a lot of the time, a, a cartoon will be juxtaposing two issues like, hey, we've learned a lesson here with COVID about the importance of listening to science, scientists and people who know what they're talking about. Yeah. And, Oh, what's that remind us of? Climate change is a very similar sort of thing where we really need to pay attention to the science if we're going to um, uh, really address the issue. Yeah. Now, with this one, um, you know, it speaks to wearing a face mask has become a political statement for many during this pandemic. So what were you trying to say with these two cartoons? Uh, well, there's been... Uh, the, this is basically lampooning the White House's tendency to make light of the pandemic and also make light of the uh, public health guidelines that have been put out. And um, they were refusing to wear masks. This is a, a cartoon from a few months ago, but they were basically refusing to wear masks in the White House. In fact, it was sort of a mark of disdain if you showed up with a mask, apparently. Um, and then I was sort of imagining, well, they're, you know, they're trying to put a happy face on the whole situation. So... I, uh, hopefully this conveys that. And then the second cartoon? Yeah, the, the other one is just, uh, you know, everybody recognizes the old trope of Uncle Sam, I want you. Yeah. And this one was quite popular. This one got picked up quite a bit in social media. Um, you know, some people sending this off to their Uncle Buck who was refusing to wear a mask and wasn't yeah. getting with the, the war on the virus. Yeah. So I, it's also, this one's an example in some ways of, a lot of cartoons are not necessarily meant to be funny. I mean, cartoonists like me, we are akin to newspaper columnists, um, mm. trying to address serious issues, perhaps in a non-serious way, but nonetheless um, contributing to sort of the political argument and debate that's going on in the country. Yeah. So this last cartoon speaks about the definition of a pandemic being a global outbreak of disease. What were you trying to convey here in this last cartoon? Well, this is mostly me just, uh, I really love to draw fire trucks. I'm basically, <laughs> so uh, it started with the fire truck. No, no this, was, this was back when um, uh, it was, uh, Trump was pulling out of the WHO right in the middle of a global pandemic. And uh, my understanding is that we're one of the prime, if not the prime benefactor supporter of the WHO. And it just, Again, a simple analogy, hopefully, that clarifies a dynamic for people in a somewhat humorous way. But this is uh, 
Trump taking his hose and heading home yeah. from the fire truck. So for this final segment of our uh, conversation today, Matt, can I ask you to draw an impromptu cartoon so our viewers may gain some better insights into the drawing part of your creative process as an editorial cartoonist? Okay, I would, I'd be happy to do that. Um, I will demonstrate on camera that the uh, first step in a cartoon is really not the drawing, it's the idea. Um, when I was a young cartoonist starting out, um, my, uh, my mentor, Paul Conrad, who was a great cartoonist at the Los Angeles Times, hammered into my head, it's, it's not the drawing, it's really, you gotta come up with a really good mm. concept. Yeah. Um, but knowing that you were gonna put me on the spot, I have been cogitating. <laughs> okay. um, and to demonstrate another part of political cartooning is grabbing sort of a news item that is uh, relatively fresh and responding to it. So just last night, I'm not sure when this is gonna go up uh, online, but just last night we had the vice presidential debate. And like many things in politics, we got all uh, fixated on a strange thing that maybe wasn't the central issue, but the fly, the fly that landed on Vice President Pence's hair and kept sort of hanging out. So um, I've been trying to figure out what to do with the fly and um, yeah, pull some paper up here. So I was imagining that what I could do is I could, this is a rough sketch on camera. I'm not used to doing this. Um, so I would start with maybe, I normally, when I'm doing a cartoon, I will do three or four or even more um, rough sketches, uh, pencil sketches and then overlays with more sketches and things like that. Um, but in this case, there's Mike Pence, who's got very dark eyebrows, fortunately. And then I was imagining as I was watching the fly last night in the debate, it was this thing that Pence refused to respond to. He was not going to like shoo the fly away or do anything like that. He, um, he stayed perfectly still and he just hoped that if he ignored it, then everybody would ignore the fact that there was a big fly on his very white hair. And I was realizing that in some ways, the fly is like a perfect metaphor for the pandemic. Hmm. That the vice president was sitting there really hoping that the fly would just fly away or as President Trump has said, magically disappear. So fortunately, the, we have a very um, graphic virus. Thank you scientists who've been taking those pictures of the virus. It's a very, it's a good virus for cartooning. Um, it, it's very distinctive and now it's become an icon that everybody recognizes. And so I was thinking what I could do with a cartoon is I could turn the virus into the fly that Mike Pence really hopes we're not gonna notice is sitting right there on his forehead or on his scalp. And then I get, I'm, I'm old fashioned. I would be very comfortable working in the 19th century as a cartoonist. I would then spend a lot of time doing cross hatching and shading like Thomas Nast or one of those cartoonists, but. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, Matt, I appreciate you letting our audience and myself be a fly on the wall uh, <laughs> of your creative process. <laughs> uh, and on that note, I want to thank Matt Worker for sharing his artistic insights with our audience today. Matt, thanks again for being a guest on Ethics Talk. Thank you, Artie. Real pleasure. For more COVID ethics resources, please visit the AMA Journal of Ethics at journalofethics.org. And finally, to our viewing audience out there, be safe and be well. We'll see you next time on Ethics Talk. <laughs>